Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this installment of our hybrid church school. The last Sunday in February. Man, this year going fast already. February 26, 2023. So we're going to go ahead and get ready to get started. Let us look to the Lord in a word of prayer. Lord, we bless your name. We say thank you. We glorify you. You say, we say that you are holy. And so we thank you once again for this opportunity to gather in this place to discuss and read your word and study your word. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come in, that you would impact our spirits this morning, impact our hearts, that we might receive that which you would have for us. Have your way in this session. Get the glory for yourself. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and we say amen. Amen. All right, so today's lesson, the last lesson for the quarter, February 26, 2023, God calls you into light. God calls you into light. Our lesson scripture is 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 25, but our focus text for this morning is 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And this is the key verse that is lifted up for us to focus and focus on you are a chosen race a royal priesthood a holy nation god's own people in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light and that's first peter chapter 2 verse 9 so our text this morning reads this way the first Peter chapter, the first, first Peter <laughs> chapter two, verses one through ten, the New Revised Standard Version. Rid yourselves, therefore, of all malice and all oh, guile, and sincerity, envy, and all slander. Man, we eliminated right there. <laughs> Most of us failed that verse right there. Verse two. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, see, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you, then, who believe, he is precious. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner and a stone that makes them stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let the church say amen. We can close the, the lesson right there on that last two verses. For God's grace that called us out of darkness into his marvelous light, who called us a holy nation, a royal priesthood, made us his own people. So some of our key terms uh, for today, uh, malice, the Greek definition, ill will, uh, to despise or injure, deceit, and the Greek is doulos, doulos. Uh, in Greek mythology, uh, it's the spirit of trickery, 
Um, it's a cunning, it's a master of cunningness, of deception, uh, crafty, craftiness, and treachery. A hypocrite, uh, in the Greek, the definition means the acting of a stage player, the acting of a stage player, and all evil speaking. In the Greek, it is katalalia, katalalia. It's pronounced katalalia. Uh, to speak down about someone, gossip, backbiting, spreading rumors, lying. They said tail bear, lying. <laughs> and so our introduction this morning, the author opens up with a question. What would you tell people shortly before your death? What would you tell people shortly before your death? And so then he supposes what Peter might have said. Peter probably wrote this letter while in a Roman prison shortly before his execution. He wanted to leave a critical message to Asia Minor churches. God's grace in Jesus Christ gives Christians transformation or transformative power, leading to righteous living. Peter reminds the church that they were living stones being built into a spiritual house whose foundation, whose cornerstone is Jesus the Christ. So Peter reminds us of who we are in this first letter to the churches of Asia Minor in 1 Peter chapter 2. And so, so Peter wants us to understand this critical message about God's grace because God's grace gives all of us who believe in the saving power of Jesus Christ, transformative power. And I, I think that's important for us to always remember and realize that because we claim to be a part of the body of Christ, that we claim to be a daughter of Christ, a daughter uh, of God and a son of God and a, a brother to Christ and a sister to Christ, that because of that relationship and the grace of God that is offered to us through Jesus Christ, there is some transformative power that we can tap into. And we call that power the Holy Spirit. That power is the word of God. And so Peter reminds us not only there's a transformative power that we can tap into that should, that should literally change our lives, but there's also an attitude, there's also a way in which we should live when we encounter this transformative power. And so, and so, and so Peter says, don't forget who you are. You've been transformed by the power of God to live righteous lives, to be the church <laughs> who was built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. We have power to be transformed. Why are we transformed? To live lives that are, are righteous and acceptable to God because we're part of the body called Christ, which is church that was built upon Jesus' sacrifice. And so as we go on, so we're called out of the darkness into the marvelous light. All right, anybody got anything they want to add there? Or are we just listening right now? All right. So 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, telling the Bible story. Christians, the building material for God's spiritual house, must become the best stones available. I like that opening sentence. Christians, who are the materials for God's spiritual house, we must become the best stones available. Stones that last will not have defects. Imagine what would happen if your house were made with faulty brick, stones, adobe, cement, tin, hay, or straw. Care must be exercised when building on Jesus's foundation. 
And that's 1 Corinthians 3, verses 10 through 15. Paul says there's no other foundation laid that there is other than Christ Jesus. And so that's what Paul tells us, or Paul is saying to the Corinthian church that we can glean from Paul's letter to the Corinthian church. Remember who our foundation is built upon. Therefore, Peter tells believers to rid themselves of negativity. They were to shed the, des they were to shed the desires to injure others the spirit of trickery, pretend behaviors, and belittling speech. Pure milk, God's word, the logos, who is Jesus, which we know in John 1 and 1, for in the beginning was the word, the word was God, the word was with God, and you know we know John 1 and 1, should replace destructive behaviors. Just as a baby needs milk, for proper and healthy growth, Christians must desire unadulterated spiritual nutrition, which is the basic teachings about Christ. They have acquired the basics. Peter, of, once they have acquired the basic, Peter advises the churches that spiritual growth will occur. This milk, the gospel, will allow them to taste and savor God's goodness. Then they will again, then they will gain greater appreciation for all God did for their personal salvation, which includes forgiveness, healing, and deliverance. And I must say that I'm going to self analyze That ain't the whole list that we get from salvation, but I like them three. That's, that's good three. I will add a couple more in there blessings and protection I mean, all that good stuff that we get out of being saved by God, saved, saved through salvation. And so after um, kind of breaking down these first three verses, it all reminds us that, that we are the stones, that we are the foundation of Christ's church. Notice I said, I ain't say the pastor's church. I ain't say the denomination's church, the Christ's church that we are the foundation of Christ's church, that we should be perfect stones, but we can't, you know, we ain't gonna be perfect, but we should be good stones. We should be stones that, that, that have very few blemishes, stones that can be set upon the foundation that's not gonna make the, the, the structure uh, get out of, get out of uh, alignment, uh, get out of square, get out of plumb. And he says, because you've been made these stones that you that that you got to begin to then grow. He says, how do you grow? You got to grow by taking in the word of God, the unadulterated word of God. You know, that word of God that Hebrew talks about that separates bone from marrow, <laughs> you know, sharper than a two edged sword. That word of God that sometimes when you come to church, you got to think about what the preacher preached because it because it cuts you in the right place. And it's something that the Holy Spirit allowed to, to impact you that, you know, that's the area I need to deal with in my life. You know, I love to come to church and feel good when I leave. But every once in a while, that man called D.K. Kearney, he steps on some toes, all 10 of them that I have. And I got to think about and reexamine some things in my own life. Sit here teaching and, and having discussions about our Sunday school lessons. Sometimes I got to reevaluate with even what I'm teaching that what are you saying to me, God, that I need to work on? And so so as these stones who are building the foundation of the church that's built on top of Christ. Peter challenges us that we must grow and that we must understand that we have been transformed by the power of God just because of our relationship with Christ. All right, and so, and so the author asks a couple questions here. One of the questions the author asks is what attributes, I mean, what attributes or traits do you need to eliminate from yourself? I'm like, man, he hit hard early. I had to think about that thing. I'm like, I don't know, that's a hard one. And, and that's a question of transparency, really. Cause, Cause, the stuff that you really need to eliminate, a lot of times you don't want to share. <laughs> 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 
And so, and so as I mean, as 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 our beloved pastor would say, that's a real question. <laughs> I'm learning, that's a real question. Uh, so what attributes or traits do you need to eliminate from yourself? For those who are brave and willing to share this morning, the mic is open. Unmute yourselves and let us hear what, what, what you would like to share. The first one came to my mind was gossip. Gossip. Um, you know, yeah, gossip. A lot, Amen. Of times, <laughs> a lot of times we do it so naturally, we don't think it's gossip. <laughs> But but when I read that, that first thing popped in my mind was gossip. All right, for those in the sanctuary, in case you did not hear, our sister Carolyn said gossip. Then I heard some amens correspond in the background. I don't know if y'all heard that. And so and so there's some uh, co-signing on that one uh, from the from the from the folks <laughs> online and in the sanctuary. I see some head nodding in the sanctuary, and her statement was that sometimes it's so easy for us to operate in the spirit of gossip that we only realize we operating in gossip. <laughs> Anybody else want to share? I, I, I'm going to share mine. I'm going to share mine. I had another one also. Well, I had two more to go with it, but one, I should have read this before I went out the door this morning because I just went to McDonald's <laughs> real quick to get a coffee and my food. And... I get here to the house because I just grab the bag and go because I want to make sure I get here on time. Wasn't right, was it? Huh? <laughs> <But Go ahead. laughs> I got in my bag and my, my sausage biscuit is missing. So the first thing that gets up to my mind was anger because, and you know, you're supposed to be slow to anger and everything else. But I was just like, okay, give me a minute. Lord, the Lord devil's trying to mess with me this morning. I tried to get back on one. I lo had everything logged in and ready and it still wouldn't pop up. So I got to get that anger out of me and, and try to not be so mad so quick. I need more patience instead. And my other one was um, stop being judgmental because, oh, yeah. ooh, some things that you see and you think and you and you go for it and then you find out the truth. So um, I got to stop judging others and, and think about how they judge me. All right, that's good stuff. And so Sister Michelle said, uh, anger and being judgmental. And so I'm gonna come back to that. Uh, Dr. Plummer had her hand up, I think she wanted to add something. No, this this is a personal question directed to you. And so so Dr. Plummer said she needs to uh, help eliminate the fear of change, the fear of things being different, being able to adjust when, you know, I guess when things don't go the way she planned and they got another direction and you got to go that way. And, you know, all of us have probably been on the GPS going somewhere that we kind of have an idea where to go, but we ain't exactly know. And then the GPS gives us some directions. We say, I know that ain't the right way. <laughs> huh? <laughs> yeah, she said being directional. <laughs> yeah. And so, and, so, <laughs> and so for myself, when I thought about the question, uh, let me say, I said, this is honest. This, this, I had to think about this for a good, good couple minutes. I said, don't know if I will eliminate this, but definitely could work on not being over analytical. The paralysis of analysis. And sometimes I could be that way because I can be over analytical and something comes my way that I need to move upon and I know it's good. I know it's kind of line with God would, would, would be okay with me doing, but I'm thinking about it and I'm thinking about it and they're like, well, I don't know. Well, did this and that. And then by the time I come to a decision, the opportunity is gone. And who knows what the opportunity could have brought about, you know? Maybe me missing the opportunity because I'm over analytical and not, and, 
And so, so me being over analytical and trying to, trying to course correct on that doesn't mean I need to be instantaneous neither. <laughs> there is a fair balance. And, and, so, and so let me say this. So when I thought about this question, I realized there are, there are some things that I don't, or we don't, I don't, we don't need to eliminate, but there's some things we need to have better control over. And so, so I take uh, Sister Michelle's uh, piece she said about anger. She said, I got to get rid of anger out of my life. Well, I would suggest, or I would submit to her that anger is an emotion that God has given all of us. The issue is not the anger. And she spoke to this in, in her explanation. She said, she said, well, I, I got to learn to sin now. That's the thing about anger. Sometimes anger is an indication that something's wrong. And there's something I need to course correct from. And so anger can be a good emotion. The question is, what do we do with that anger when it rises? And so, so, so anger, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily, I need to eliminate anger. If, if that was my issue, because anger is, is, is a warning sometimes, it's a warning trigger. It's like, it's like me uh, burning my finger on the stove and I said, God, I gotta, I gotta eliminate feeling the pain from the burn. <laughs> you know, I gotta get that out of my life. I can't be feeling no pain from a burn. No, that's me feeling the heat in that burn is an indicator. Oh, I, I better not put my finger there again. I better not do this again that I need to go control how I operate around the stove. I need to control how I operate in these areas because it could cause me danger. It could cause me injury. And, and some things we don't need to eliminate, we need to learn to process them better. But then there are some things that we need to get rid of. So don't get me wrong, I ain't giving nobody an out, I ain't giving myself a, there's some things we know that are absolutely wrong Absolutely that we don't need to let be a part of our lives and we have to have the willpower and strength to get rid of those things. To not no longer allow those things to have control over who we are and what we do. All right, so the second question, what basic teachings about Jesus must new Christians understand? If you were talking to somebody as a new Christian, what would you tell them with some basic things that they would need to understand about this new Christian relationship that they've entered into with Jesus? God is faithful all the time. Uh, just, uh, not the, uh, Hold on, y'all. Shandell was saying something from the booth. What'd you say, Shandell? Uh, uh, yeah. Amen. So Shandell said being Christian does not mean you're perfect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hear the amens in the background, Shadell. I see the head shaking mm -hmm. in the sanctuary, and you was I'm looking at say, my. <laughs> I was gonna say the I was gonna say the same thing. So, tell brother, brother Ender said he was gonna say the same thing. What, what, what else would y'all share with that person? Well, now that you changed it around on me, at first I was, you know, how we need to love one another more and be more compassionate and caring. Um, but I don't know. I think that's something you grow into. That's not just a basic. That's something you would have to grow into. I mean, that, that is a basic in the, and that, that, that's an acceptable answer. I mean, because Christ loved us and it's the love of, love of God that sent Christ on our behalf. And so we got to Got to help them to understand that there's a love that he calls us to. You've been looking at my notes too, but go ahead. <laughs> Who else got anything? I would tell them to be patient because it's a process and you're constantly changing, evolving and growing as a Christian. So be patient with yourself. You know, that I think comes in with the not being perfect. All right, so Sister Inez said, be patient with yourself because it's a growing process. It's you're going to change. In other words, it kind of speaks to what Peter told, told the church in Asia Minor, that you got, that you're going to, there's transformative power. So this new relationship in Christ will eventually cause us to transform, to change. 
And so, and so, um, so I put a few things. I said that Jesus, I said I would tell them one thing that Jesus forgives, that Jesus does not require perfection, but faithfulness. And Jesus is calling us to love unconditionally. Now, how we move away, move into those things is a whole, you know, a whole nother part of our Christian experience. But I believe those are some foundational things where we agree that we that Jesus forgives us because oftentimes as new believers, we we bring our baggage into this new relationship and that baggage pulls us down because we think about who we were, what we did, who we did it with, how we did it, how long we did it. And, and, and we like, God will never forgive me for that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so we bring this stuff in and it, it hinders our growth because we're stuck. What's behind us instead of looking ahead to what God has in front of us. And so we, we let that hinder us, that, uh, that, that peace that he forgives. And then like she, Shandell said, you know, God hadn't called anybody to be perfect. He calls us to be faithful. That's why he got on the disciples in the boat when they was going across the lake of Genazareth to go to the other side and the storm arrived. And they lost their minds about, don't you care, we gonna die and all this other stuff. And Jesus gets up from the boat. When Jesus gets up, they had that conversation and he tells them, oh, ye a little faith. He didn't say, oh, ye a, oh, ye a little faith. So, you know, be faithful, be, be faithful. Faithfulness counts. And Jesus calling us to love unconditionally. That's, and that's probably one of the tough, the, that's probably one, three of the toughest things for us to, to kind of wrap our minds around because we live in a society that, uh, that kind of scales what's good and what's bad. And uh, we, we got this rating system for sin. And so if you murder somebody, I can't love you. You, you the worst of the worst. But if you lie, it's okay. I can I can love you, forgive you, because you ain't do nothing but lie. And God and Christ has not put any conditions or caveat on, on who to love and how and how to love, except for love them unconditionally. And we said on first Sundays, well, I mean, we don't really say it now because we've been we kind of adapted our service, but we to say the summer of the Decalogue. We talked about this a couple Sundays ago. You know, what is the, the, the greatest commandment? When they asked Jesus, they said, Master, good master, you a great teacher. You know, we trying to, they trying to trick dreams. And they said, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus said, well, let me think about it. I'm going to tell you this. It's to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And he says, matter of fact, there's a second part to it. He said, love your neighbor as yourself. And then he told these religious folks who understood the law but didn't understand grace that if you can do this, all that stuff y'all following in the law will be fulfilled. All the stuff that the prophets came and told you about me and about this relationship, you can fulfill that if you can do just those two things. And so notice nowhere in that response that Jesus said, love those who are only, uh, I ain't gonna get that, but love those who only do this or do that. But those who do this or do that, you can't love those. No, Jesus said, love your neighbor. And we know we got some crazy neighbors. <laughs> we got some good neighbors. <laughs> Jesus said, love your neighbors like you love yourself. And so when we learn to unconditionally love ourselves, forgive ourselves, we learn to understand that we're not perfect we can then begin to transfer what we feel about ourselves to others. Cause, cause you know, most of us don't beat up on ourselves. There are some of us that do that, but most of us love ourselves unconditionally <laughs> and we can move on from stuff that we do that we know that, you know, folks might not should love us for or should, you know. All right, let, let me move on. I'm kind of beating that there. Anybody else got anything else they want to add? Uh, Sister Johnson? Amen. Sister Johnson says we got to teach new Christians to remember to always ask for forgiveness. Don't stop. 
remember to keep going, asking for forgiveness. Because the truth be told, you're going you to keep doing some things until he call you home to your eternal resting place that you're going to need to be forgiven for. <laughs> That's a reality of life because once again, we are not perfect. That was, that was Jesus's job to be the perfect sacrifice, to show us what perfection looks like so that we may strive to meet his mark or meet his standard. All right, First Peter uh, 2 verses four and eight, so the author says, Peter, who Jesus named Petros, the rock, describes the churches as living stones. For Jewish believers reading this analogy of their being stones, it would, it would recall Isaiah 26, I mean 28, 16, and its fulfillment. See, I lay a, a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. And Jesus' words in Matthew 21, uh, verse 42, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Jesus, chief, the chief cornerstone, sets the direction for all other stones. Example, Christians who come to him. Together, these church members who are stones form a spiritual house where sacrifices are offered. For Peter, believers have become an unapologetically spiritual house before they were dependent upon the priest to burn sacrifices, but now the spiritual house of made of Christians offer their bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, Romans 12, 1. Jesus, the chief cornerstone, ensures Christians that can stand upright and live holy. For those who do not believe in Jesus, the chief cornerstone, their disbelief will cause them to trip because of their uh, thinking, thinking blocks, because of their thinking blocks from blocks them, slow down there, blocks them from getting to the truth. And trapped with their own logic, unbelievers do not trust God's love and grace. Rather, they choose to construct other pathways that cannot quench the hungry and thirsty soul. Ooh, that's good. I, all right. And knowing Jesus and his redemptive work leads to sin that causes people to stumble. So that, that, that second to last sentence jumped out at me, then jumped out at me in our study. Thought about some stuff about when he said, rather they choose to construct other pathways that cannot quench the hungry and thirsty soul. And then and just jumped in my spirit about some of the addictions that people have. A lot of time, the root of that is they're trying to, trying to quench something inside of them some thirst, some longing that's not being fulfilled in their relationships and the society. And, and so they get caught up in these other things when the thing that can, can satisfy them is Christ. As he said, he's the living water. <laughs> he's the bread that we may not hunger no more, water that we may not thirst no more. All right, that kind of got off the mark there. All right, and so... And so Peter is talking about how the church of living stones, we kind of talked about this earlier, and he talked about Jesus being the chief cornerstone. Now, I ain't no construction expert, <laughs> but one thing I do know is that when, laying, when constructing the building, the first stone that you lay, or the first, if you construct the deck, whatever you construct, whatever that first piece that you put has to be centered, it has to be level, it has to be square, and it needs to be plumb. Because if you don't start off center, level, square, plumb, whatever you're building, as you lay other pieces upon that piece, you may not see the deviation, but as you further go down the line, you might start here, but as you further lay, if it's if it's off this way, and but you don't really, it's only I mean just a little bit off. The further you go, you begin to see it do this. It becomes out of level. It becomes out of square, and so so that's the importance of us understanding that Jesus is our foundation, because Jesus is perfect. And when we begin to build off the perfectness of Jesus, I don't know if that's a real word, but I made it up. If we build off the perfectness of Jesus or the perfection of Jesus, 
we can then begin to live level lives, lives that are centered, lives that are square. We'll go ahead, Dr. Plummer. In terms of the building, uh-huh. the fact that we have Jesus as our foundation, the cornerstone, we have the Holy Spirit as our morning. Amen. Amen. So uh, Dr. Plummer said, in terms of building and Jesus is our cornerstone and we are the and we are the, the, the pieces that lay on top of that the Holy Spirit is our mortar. The Holy Spirit is that thing that connects the bricks together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She said you just can't put it anywhere and you can't put it on any kind of <laughs> and building brick structures and, and concrete structures that are cinder block structures, there has to be something that joins them together. Thank you for that. And that's the Holy Ghost. <laughs> and that's how we become one body through the power of the Holy Ghost as we build upon the foundation of Christ. That's good stuff. And so, and so once we are part of this, this spiritual uh, building, the spiritual structures, are part of this body, we, we then begin to offer sacrifices up to God. We, we offer ourselves, we, 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 offer, we offer this, this new transformed life uh, uh, that, that we have gotten out of result of being called out of darkness and to God's marvelous light. And, and so y'all know Romans 12 and one and two, my, my favorite verse, one of my favorite verse, but probably the number one favorite verse, I got a lot on, but the number one favorite. And, and I love uh, what Paul tells the church of Rome when he's speaking to them in this particular verse, and he uses this Old Testament, uh, uh, not analogy, but metaphors or this Old Testament um, word picture, and he talks about being a living sacrifice and, and that you are the living sacrifice. And we understand that in the Old Testament, when the priests were called uh, to worship, they were the only ones that could do sacrifices and they would, they would have to get, kill an animal drain the blood, put it on the altar, burn, a, burn the animal. And Paul saying, no, now you are taking place of that, that sacrifice that the priest had because you are in relationship. So you are to put yourself on the altar. <laughs> you, you are to become not a dead sacrifice, but a living sacrifice for God. That's holy and acceptable. And, and, so, and so that holy and acceptable piece is, the, is one of the things that, that, that sometimes trips us up in the body because, because we have this lofty expectation of what holiness is. Uh, and sometimes we have a misguided uh, interpretation of what holiness is. You know, we, we, we have denominations that's got that in their names and, they, and, and holiness to them sometimes within their doctrine. Um, what's the word I look for? Sometimes within their structure of their worship, and I ain't talking bad on about, so if you hear this, I'm not, I'm not talking bad about, we just talking, is that, that holiness becomes a, an appearance. Holiness becomes a dress. Holiness becomes whether you can speak in tongues or not. Holiness becomes, you know, um, is your dress below to your, to your shins or, you know, whatever it is. And it's funny how all the holiness standards fall on the sisters, but they don't fall on us. But that's a whole nother, you know, I ain't, all right, let me get back on subject. <laughs> I am on subject, but let me get back, narrow my, my thing. It, it, that's just funny. That's, it's not funny, funny, but you know what I mean. All right, and so, and so there's this call to holiness because we've been transformed by the power of God. We've been called out of darkness into light. And now we are these stones that make up the body of Christ. And there's an expectation for us to, to go and share this new experience with others. All right, I'm going to move on so we can kind of get out. It's almost time to go. All right, so the last two verses, 1 Peter uh, 2, verse 9 and 10, this is what the writer says. He says, after Peter tells uh, churches they should be pure and that they are living stones, he makes distinctions between who they are versus who non-believers are. These admirable attributes contain responsibilities being a chosen people means having humility. Uh, can Chosen people uh, were selected by God because they were unimportant and insignificant. I found that interesting that he said that. A royal priesthood, 
um, being consecration or set apart for God's service. Like the charge given to Aaron and his sons, a priest should always have a shining light, maintain fellowship, pray for others and self, and offer daily sacrifices to God. A holy nation sets God's standards. Our God expects believers to be holy because the God they worship is holy. People sharing these titles come together as one body, the body of Christ. And as the body of Christ, they are ambassadors. God's representatives who share the gospel. Notice they ain't say that was the preachers and the ministers. They say as the body uh, of Christ, they are ambassadors, God's representatives who share the gospel. They spread the good news about God's love extended to any and everybody. And so that's where we are. That's, that's the lesson. We almost time to close. See, we get a couple questions in. And so Peter is reemphasizing to the church who we are and who we should be because God has called us from this darkness into his marvelous light. Oh, let me backtrack. This just jumped back in my spirit. And they talked about how how those who would not believe that it would become a stumbling block to them and they would fall. And I thought about because, because Peter before that talks about being called from darkness to light. And so those who are not, who did not accept that call are still in darkness. So they could not see the stumbling blocks in their way. And so they tripped and failed. And, they, and, and so that whole analogy plays in our mind to help us better understand what God is calling us to as the body of Christ. to be those who have been transformed by the power of God, for those, who, for those of us to have been called from our sinful, dark natures into God's marvelous light, and to realize that we have been chosen by God to be his people, to be holy, to be acceptable. And so this walk, of being part of the body, this walk of being a believer is not an easy walk. It challenges us in all areas of our life to, 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 to be better. Not to be perfect, but to be better. All right, I mean, all right, I want to ask, God, this 45 minutes go fast. <laughs> I have a question. I know, we need, we need to get back to our hour somehow. <laughs> My question is, I went through everything. I answered most of the questions in the question part, but I was stumbling on number two. So I wanted to know, how do you answer that one? How do you explain Jesus as a living stone to a non-believer? Uh, I, I guess it kind of go back to that uh, building analogy. I, I said earlier, let me share what I put there. I said, um, uh, through a construction analogy by emphasizing the importance and role of the cornerstone and then relating that to Jesus. So if you kind of get a little bit understanding of that construction analogy that I was saying about how the importance of laying that cornerstone and that's, that's the stone that we got to build everything off of to make sure everything's straight, to make sure everything's square, level, plumb. And then you have to help to understand that that is the role of Jesus, that that not only is he, he that cornerstone, but he's a living uh, uh, example of what we need to build our lives off of. And so that's, that's kind of, that's my answer. That help? Yes, thank you. All right, any other questions before we close out? All right, because we're over, as the, I think you used to, Fred Price used to say, we're, we're over time, but we're not out of word. So all right. <laughs> So let us uh, look to the Lord. Lord, we thank you for the lesson. We pray, God, that you would help us understand the importance of being transformed, the importance of being called from, our, from darkness into light, and that we are to go and share the wonderful works of you, that we will learn to, to, to in, uh, embrace the word of God, to feed on the word of God, that you may change us and that you may transform us and that you may connect us together as the body of Christ through the mortar of your Holy Spirit. So have your way in our lives, have your way in this next worship experience. Get the glory for yourself. It's in Christ's name that we pray and we say amen. Amen. Thank you all. See you all next Sunday, March 1st. <laughs> I'll be out.
Y'all have a good week. All right, y'all too.